so John is one of my favorite speakers. I always learn something from him, um, which is why I love uh, listening to him talk. Um, but I have to warn you, he's very fast. Um, <laughs> We've got a lot to get through. You have got a lot to get through. Um, so this, I think, is going to be one of the fastest sessions. I'm not sure if you've got the most slides. Maybe <laughs> um, you're, you're doing OK. What happened is um, as we clock down to uh, half past three, I'll, I know you've been watching in the background, but I'll introduce you properly. Then I'll turn my camera off. And then about um, three minutes to, I'll come back on. Um, I don't mind if you go over a little bit. Um, and uh -huh. the reason I don't mind if you go over a little bit is because um, Fred is literally, Fred, Fred, Fred Valise is literally waking up over in the USA in California. Um, and so I'm, I've got to make sure he's here. So <laughs> um, I'm expecting him to sort of roll up about quarter two. Um, and then at least I know he's here. Um, but I'm sure we can speak for another five minutes if we, if we need to be. Nice. <laughs> are you, um, are you okay? Like, yeah, super. It looks like my font has messed up on the PowerPoint. There. So what I might just do is move to two screens and try and do a share of the Google Drive thing while there's fighting with fonts. You can. Uh, if you share your screen, if you go to share yeah. screen, um just, and then um, that will allow you to bring up your slides um nice fancy 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 the hand the handouts are up there so if you'd like to refresh your screens guys uh you should see both jono's and uh fred's um slides um as we just wait for that to load and then is it okay you happy there we go yeah that looks great excellent okay well, while that's just loading, I'll introduce you um, and for the recording, and then I'll hand over to you. So uh, this is our penultimate presentation of Leicester Digital Live of the day. Um, I'm, is, it, I've been trying to get Jono to speak for a couple of years now. I've, I've known Jono for a while. He's one of my favourite speakers. I always learn absolutely gallons from him, um, and you're going to have an amazing trip into the future of the web. Of the web. Uh, so over to you, Jono. I'll see you in about 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. And we were just saying um, how lovely it is that there are so many people here um, fighting through the end of the world to learn more about digital marketing. This is where all the cool kids hang out. So, um, yeah, this is going to be fast. We've got a lot to get through, but hopefully I can inspire you and point you in the right direction and arm you for what's next. Do feel free to ask questions. So I want to talk about what happens when everybody's website is fixed. I want you to imagine a world where brands compete not on how big their marketing budgets are or how many developers they have on their staff or how clever their website is. I want you to think about a world where brands compete on a level playing field based on their virtues and how good a fit their product is for me here and now. I want you to think about which brands would survive and which ones would fail. I want you to think about how we as marketers might stack those odds. What would we do as brand owners, as investors, as users? I think this isn't as far-fetched a utopia or dystopia as you might imagine. And I think we need to start asking these types of questions right now because the world is changing. It's cliche to talk about how quickly the web is evolving, but the technology, the platforms, the capabilities, the tools, the metrics, the ecosystem grows and evolves faster than we can comprehend or keep up with. That's why we're here today. We see digital and analog and mixed realities merging and blending, commerce and social interactions woven through everything we do. Desktop, mobile, tablet, TV, apps, toasters, these walls break down and blur into one connected reality. But our businesses, and the way we do business isn't changing. The ways we try and part our audiences with their time or money or attention or preference haven't adapted. It hasn't really changed at all since the birth of the early web. We took our analog offline models and we plonked them onto the internet. Just like running a brick and mortar store, we pick our target audiences, we saturate them with messaging, we create our environments, and we try and attract them to come to our platform. And then our sales teams and processes tell stories and weave narratives to try and convince those audiences that our solutions are a good fit for them. We're picking up some new shiny toys and technologies and tools, but transposing how we run retail stores and offline businesses onto the internet will only get us so far. It's not the right model for what comes next. I think the businesses need to change and evolve, otherwise they will fail, and soon. 
they'll, they'll invest in the wrong areas. They won't be discovered by researching consumers. The products and services they sell won't be chosen. Because today, consumers live in an information-scarce world. This sounds like a crazy thing to say when you consider that all of human knowledge is available at the click of a finger. But one of the main reasons this old-school attract, convince, and convert mechanism continues to work online is that consumers aren't omniscient. They don't know everything. And they often don't have the time or inclination to minutely analyze the detailed strengths and weaknesses and nuance of every product and service they consider. And even if they wanted to, often they don't have access to all of the information. If I'm buying a new car, I don't know, I don't have a breakdown of the costs and that say how much of that money goes towards the production or the marketing or into the investor's pockets. That information is opaque. So organizations put a huge amount of energy into building and promoting brands. We all know this. A brand we might describe as the sum total of the experiences that a user has with all of your messaging, with your product, your platform, and everything in that ecosystem. And of course, as brands, we want our audiences to believe our value propositions and our messaging and our storytelling and to buy into the narratives that we spin around our trade-offs of cost, quality, convenience, availability, and so on and so forth, and to choose our brand over that of our competitors. What's changing? Hmm, in fact, rewind a little bit more because what's important is that in an information-scarce world, audiences use brand as a proxy for information. As consumers, we want to make rational, informed purchase decisions. But when we don't have access to all of the information, we fall back to trust. The brands, the stories that brands tell and how well they resonate with us determines how trustworthy we believe them to be, how well they can convince us that their particular trade-off of values is a good fit for us. So they compete to have the most compelling content or the most links from fancy websites or the most reviews or the best reviews. These are all proxies for building consumer trust. Imagine for a moment, what would happen as a user if you had full transparency, if you could see through the marketing spiel and storytelling and have a completely informed, perfect understanding of the product, the service, the quality, the platform, the money, the distribution, the R&D, the marketing, all of it, every single aspect of the thing you're evaluating. If you completely understood those cost quality trade-offs of every product and company you were considering, would you shop differently? I think the answer is probably yes. And I want you to hold this idea in your head to see where we go next, because this is going to become increasingly important. Because Google's race towards omniscience is changing the web. I want to talk about how their ambition to become the Star Trek computer that just solves user problems is fundamentally changing consumer behavior. How they're getting better and better at understanding those values and trade-offs of cost, of quality, of convenience, of storytelling, and other factors which influence purchase decisions. They don't need to trust that a brand has a good product or that it's priced fairly for an audience or so on. Google doesn't suffer from information scarcity. And increasingly, they're using their insight to make decisions on our behalf as users of what a good fit looks like for any given search. And critically, they determine what we don't see. Why is this relevant? Because search is how we spend. No matter where your purchase decisions and user journeys and multi-touch um, uh, attribution models begin or end, search is increasingly a critical part of all of them. Over 70% of all purchase decisions, going back as far as 2016, I think, um, involve search as a critical touch point. So when you want users, when users research and they're starting out their journey to determine what possible solutions might exist and to determine a good fit for them, we have to ensure that they see our brands as part of that journey in order for us to pitch them our value. We have to try and convince users that they can trust us in that process. What's making that harder is that quality is becoming quantifiable. And what Google in particular is getting increasingly good at is identifying the quality of fit, going beyond just reading text on a page and counting links between websites, but trying to assess and understand the actual underlying quality of the thing, looking at user interactions, web performance, product reviews, brand sentiment, and hundreds of other factors. And as their understanding of entities and language continues to improve, they can make sure that they only give me good search results for me. And when a brand isn't a good fit, when they don't meet the right balance of cost, quality, reputation, proximity, etc., for me, they won't get shown. And that means that the consumer never visits their website or installs their app or signs up to their newsletter or, or has any of those touch points that Russell described so eloquently in his last talk. Consider. 
The stories that you tell as a brand to overcome or shortcut information scarcity, which cover up your weaknesses or artificially amplify your strengths, only influence humans. And as systems get better at understanding the underlying quality of your thing and your product market fit, your storytelling and your marketing messages won't protect you. All the money you invest in telling stories to distract, to draw focus, to cover up deficiencies, to change perceptions for better or worse, becomes increasingly ineffective as the systems get better at seeing through it. And of course, one thing you can do about this is to spend more money on paid ads. In fact, many companies who are currently faced with this kind of challenge as they struggle more in organic search because their reputations or products or fits aren't good enough, adapt by simply increasing their paid advertising budgets, often, in fact, shirting it from their organic budgets from channels they perceive not to be working. And maybe that's fine, because if you can still get the consumer to come to your website or your app, you can regain control of the narrative and tell your version of the story. But that's going to get exponentially more expensive as other brands, which also aren't good fits, rely increasingly on paying to interrupt and rent attention. Now, until recently, the only people really um, uncomfortable, discomforted by this were the SEOs trying to combat it, the people trying to keep their clicks and their rankings and their website visits, chasing tactics to rely to rank higher in search engines in order to get people to click through to their site, where you can then regain control of the narrative and tell your version of the story. But now, even with the best SEO in the world, many of those searches will never see or reach those websites. You see, we're seeing a shift where Google ceases to be a gateway of content, a menu of links to brands and platforms which the user has to choose from, and instead is becoming the platform. It's not just where you search, it's where you consume and act. It's where you get your answers. It's where you start and complete your journeys. Because increasingly, I can do the thing I'm trying to do in the search results. I can buy the movie tickets, listen to podcasts, watch the movie, read the news article, buy a table, buy a product, research a car. On the surface, these just look like shiny new interfaces, fancy cards and search results. But we're getting more and more of these rich experiences, and they are replacing conventional search results. We no longer get a list of links that we have to choose from. We get answers and solutions. I can undergo complex processes and user journeys, and all of those um, touch points that might have happened on a website now happen in Google. Remember, Google's intent is to show the best result for me right here, right now, based on the intersect of everything that they know. And that best result is rarely going to be forcing me to pick a, uh, something out of a list and click through to a web page that I then have to comprehend and understand. The key to understanding these new formats is that they don't deliver clicks. They break the ecosystem, which relies on getting clicks, like the one on the right here, where Google has extracted the individual steps of a how-to guide and presented them in a dedicated format. Users don't need to click on it. They can get everything they need within the search results. And this happens at every stage of the buying cycle in every industry. This is great for consumers. It's an excellent, frictionless experience. It's happening in recipes, in jobs, in flights, in products, in mortgages, in electricity, in every market. This is the future of how we search and browse and consume. And when you look at where these kinds of featured snippets occur, it's for people who are looking for information, for people who are looking for trust. And they'll get it directly in Google. They'll never visit the brand website. This is a study from SEO tool Ahrefs looking at the kind of searches where people start their journeys. The 70% of consumers who begin their searches using words like best, versus, can, list, top. None of these people are searching for specific transactional terms, clicking on a site and then buying. They're not picking a product. They're starting to ask questions about how they might solve their problems. So it doesn't matter if you're not into SEO and it's not your main channel or if you grow your audiences offline or you only advertise on TV because consumers who are researching in your space now have entire product discovery, evaluation and conversion processes contained within Google's ecosystem. It's not just the research stages that are happening either. These problems are being solved in the search results. Recent research showed that 50% of all searches don't result in a click. And that's up year on year on year on year. These aren't people who didn't have their questions answered and got frustrated and went away. These are people whose needs were met in the search results. 70% of all search purchase decisions involve search. 50% of them never get beyond search. And it's not an insignificant percentage of these cases that these zero clicks are actually clicks due to other Google properties, maps, jobs, flights, products, recipes, news. What's important to understand is that these aren't zero click searches 
there, I got everything I needed from within Google searches. That means those people will never turn up at your store. They'll never visit your website. They'll never read your white paper or sign up for your newsletter or see your special offer because they don't need to. It's Google is where the solution to their problems are in B2C, in B2B, in enterprise sales, in all manner of conversion funnels. We need to stop thinking about Google as a search engine and start thinking about how we can provide and help Google to discover the solutions that we offer for their users. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, if you consider yourself to be a data-driven marketer and you're still chasing clicks, trying to get people to come to your platform, perhaps you're doing it wrong. Because if your users found what they needed without visiting your site, maybe your content, your brand, and your contribution to their journey wasn't that special. And if it wasn't that special, why would Google reward you by sending you visits? Maybe you have a deeper problem. Maybe that problem is broader. Because increasingly, Google are seeing other websites than Google as friction, other environments as friction, your content and marketing as friction between you and the consumer and the problem they want to solve. Because your website's slow, it's full of ads and pop-ups, it requires lots of clicking and reading and learning, it creates cognitive load, even if it's super sleek and fancy, I've still got to understand it. All of that is friction. Google don't want their users to experience friction, because if users have a poor experience, they use other search engines. And Google believes they can provide a better experience themselves with a perfect understanding of content and consumer needs and the web in situ. The very concept of marketing is friction. It's a dysfunction born from information scarcity. You only need marketing if you need trust. Google doesn't need trust. They can understand your product and your brand and your pricing and your reputation and your content. It's not a huge leap to imagine that Google's long-term strategy for organic search maybe doesn't involve sending visitors to websites. So what do we do with this? As marketers, we like pyramids, we like stacks. We need a new marketing stack to exist in this world. So here it is. Here is Google at the bottom of the new marketing stack. This is where your content is discovered and consumed. And sure, you can choose not to play here and to compete in other channels, but then the 70% of people who come through this process will see your competitor's content. And this is where your fit determines whether you're considered or discovered or remembered versus those competitors. It's where Google provides a perfect content and solution experience in situ. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're not quite there yet. This is an emerging future. We see bits of this now, but not all of it. Because whilst Google are a long way down this road and aiming to go further, they've hit a barrier. You see, they can crawl and store and process all the content on the web, but to realize their vision, they need to be able to accurately understand the content that they consume. That's hard because a lot of the web content on the web isn't structured. It's muddled up in things like paragraphs and pictures and web pages. And it's rare for publishers and writers to manage their content with precision and to structure it neatly in little databases. I love this example. This is a recipe, one of many millions, billions, potentially trillions like it on the web. How long does this meal take to prepare? It's ambiguous. The information is conflicting. It's unclear which bits of timings are wrapped into others. I don't know. I can't work out how long it takes to cook this thing. For Google, that makes it very hard to feature and use this kind of information directly in the search results. If I ask how to make a cake, this information isn't reliable enough for Google to solve my problems. They have to send me to this website. This content isn't structured enough. And this isn't a machine learning problem that Google can just throw more firepower at. It's a precision problem which is why structured data is the current next was the current war. It's why all the big search engines and platforms are investing huge amounts of resources in technology and education and experiments around structured data. It's because they see potential billions of dollars of future revenue where they're competing heavily with Amazon who have a much bigger de uh, developer ecosystem and where Google's re approach relies on essentially reading out the content of the, we uh, the websites and pages they crawl and discover and they're not very good yet. The answer to all of this is schema.org. The web as it is isn't a good enough input to fuel Google's vision of where they want to take things. They can crawl and consume, but they can't understand. So schema.org allows developers to describe things much more explicitly. I'm a huge schema nerd. I've got reams of stuff about this if you're interested, talk to me later. But imagine a, a product, for example. A product has a cost and reviews and a manufacturer and a brand and the location it's sold at and that location has opening hours. We can describe all of these attributes specifically in a way that search engines like Google can understand. And when it's in that format, they can lift it and take it and use it directly in the search engines. And they can use it to power their voice services and their smart toasters and all these other parts of this emerging ecosystem. 
The question then is if you want to influence the 70% of people who search and the 50% of people who find what they're looking for without ever leaving Google, you need to ensure that your content and product and proposition are in a format that Google can extract and consume and understand. And yes, this raises huge questions about attribution, permission, brand, traffic, clicks, and conversions, all of the KPIs that your salaries and bonuses are probably tied to. But traffic is the wrong KPI. Clicks have always been the wrong KPI. Any tactic which tries to get Google's users to leave Google are going to lead you into a dead end. Google is no longer a search engine which delivers users to your website. It's a portal that solves the problems of its consumers on its websites. Our obsession with clicks and visits and ownership of the narrative is rooted in yesterday's brick and mortar world. Now your platform needs to feed their platform. That's where we are today. This is the beginning. It's step one. Let's look at where we go next because this gets really interesting for brands and for Google. And there are lots of challenges that Google have in order to realize this kind of utopia, dystopia they want to create. The first is that broad, um, successful adoption of um, this way of thinking and this ecosystem requires standardization. To grow their reach and to solve more of these problems in situ, Google needs robust, correct schema.org markup across the majority of the web. Not 10 websites, not a million websites, but most websites across the breadth of the web. It's not enough for a few big publishers to describe their recipes in detail. They need this everywhere. And historically, Google have been awful at this kind of adoption for various poor education, poor motivation, poor support. We see this time and time again with things like Google Glass, um, ski, uh, authorship market, well, next perf. They really lack the marketing um, mechanics to get people to adopt this sort of thing at scale. Um, which is why Google have pivoted and changed how they're approaching this. So I overheard this quote at a WordPress conference a few years ago from um, a woman from a team in Google who were responsible for coordinating with publishers. And she said, um, for years, they've worked with individual websites one at a time to help them add structured data. And never once did they think to ask them what CMS they were running. They'd go to The Guardian, they'd go to The New York Times, they'd go to Wikipedia and say, hey, guys, can we help you put some schema mark upon? This is really cool. Please do the thing. And maybe a little bit of adoption. Never once did they say, maybe we ought to ask you what your infrastructure looks like and to adopt there. Which is why now suddenly Google are deeply invested and entrenched in the WordPress ecosystem, which is something very close to my heart, not least of which because it powers now over 40% of the web. And they're hiring some of the world's best PHP and WordPress developers. And they're rolling out shiny new features and toys and capabilities to new end to end users using WordPress. This is interesting because it's new behavior. Webmasters have never really been a target audience for Google in this way before until now. Google are betting a large amount of the farm on influencing the evolution of WordPress. It's the vehicle which will deliver the structured content, the access, and the precision they need to achieve their vision. Make no mistake, they'll get to other platforms soon enough, but they're spearheading the adoption of new capabilities, new schema.org standards, new plugins, new integrations with WordPress first. Now, many of you will be familiar with Gary and John, who are the public face of Google's interactions with the webmaster community. But I want to talk to you about this chap, who I'm sure many, very few of you have encountered. This is Alberto Medina, and he represents the developer relations team. The question they're trying to solve is, how do we democratize success on the web? Because technology is getting increasingly complex, abstract, sophisticated. It's harder and harder for small businesses to compete online with brands that have hundreds of developers in deep pockets. And if it's hard for small businesses to compete online, maybe they think, oh, you know what? I'll just market through Facebook pages, or maybe I'll just sell directly through Amazon. They leave Google's ecosystem, which hurts the experience of searchers, that weakens Google, and is arguably bad for the web and also means potentially one less Google Ads customer. Hmm. The inverse is more sites, more small businesses succeeding, more better content, a bigger index, all good for Google, all good for the web. So they're spending huge amounts of resources on evolving WordPress and contributing to core code, fixing bugs, rolling out new features. I talk to these guys all the time. They're doing some awesome good work for the open web. So right out of the box, if you're running on WordPress, this is not an ad for WordPress. It's just a slight observation that it might be sensible to consider what you're running your platform on because you get access to all the shiny new toys that your competitors don't have yet and won't have for a year. Because even if they're trying to replicate your competitors or your devs are trying to replicate what you can get out of WordPress, it will take you a year and you'll do that work at the expense of other things that would have moved you forwards. Essentially, on WordPress, you now get an unfair advantage when it comes to your platform. Now, there's some interesting timing around this. It comes with some broader changes in what Google are doing in the wider web. Some of you will have come across um, Gutenberg in the WordPress editor. 
launched a couple of years ago now, but the premise is that rather than writing a big wall of text, rather than just having blog posts and pages, we have blocks. Content is comprised of blocks. A recipe is a really good, good example. A recipe is a block, and that contains an image, which is a block, and it contains a list, which is a block, and another list, which is another block, and an author, which is a block that contains an image, and, a, and so on. Everything is blocky. Lists, images, calorie counts. Content authors and publishers can use blocks to structure their content. What's interesting about blocks is they are inherently structured, and structured things are easy to understand. Gutenberg blocks can output structured data and schema.org markup inherently without relying on website owners and authors and publishers to create and construct that code. So, oh, and by the way, um, if you think this is very WordPressy, Drupal are also adopting Gutenberg. Gutenberg is an open source project in its own right. It's becoming the future of the way we edit content on the web. And guess which company employs some of the most active and influential contributors to the Gutenberg process? Blocks are structure. Google, through WordPress, is solving the problem of not being able to understand the web at scale by relying on blocks and the APIs. And um, I should mention that we at Yoast have done a huge amount of work in this as well. By relying on consuming block-based content, suddenly it becomes much easier for Google to understand and to extract and to use this kind of content. Deep breath. So now all your content is in the right format for it to show up directly in the search engines. Now you can solve your users' problems in situ, which allows you to build brand recall and preference against your competitors. Good news. However, still some problems. Because even with all these shiny toys, there are challenges. The web is fundamentally inefficient. It's built poorly. It's full of errors. It's poorly maintained. Crawling and processing and storing and handling all of that is a huge cost center for Google. And as the content becomes more structured and more sophisticated, perhaps even more so, the average website is slow and inefficient and bad on mobile and has images that are too big and dodgy JavaScript and poorly managed, et cetera. There is a skills gap, an education gap, and a motivation gap for people who build websites to build them well. It's not their fault. It's just the way that um, economy works. It's getting worse. The rise of JavaScript frameworks and app-like websites makes things much harder. So Google are obsessed with speed because for them, speed is synonymous with efficiency. A faster, better web saves them millions of dollars and incidentally is a critical component of user experience. Audiences, particularly those in developing parts of the world or where mobile networks aren't great, abandon slow websites. If they're discovering those from Google, fewer of them will search. So it won't come as a surprise that some of the most sophisticated advanced thinking in the world on how to speed up websites comes from Google. Their web fundamentals and page speed insights documentation is literally writing the book on how to build fast, efficient websites, all led by a chap called Ilya Grigorik, who incidentally um, was until recently deeply involved in the WordPress community until he left for Spotify. You see a theme emerging, right? Because the best definitions that we now have for understanding and measuring speed are also from Google. So when coupled with Lighthouse audits, these core web vitals metrics, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about, are the best tool we have for understanding the quality of an experience. Except achieving and maintaining high scores across these systems is excruciatingly difficult in the real world, which is why it will come as no surprise that Google are also the leading player behind AMP, which haven't, if you haven't come across, is a framework which Google launched a few years ago, um, where the principle was that rather than building and maintaining a mobile version of your website, you would build it in AMP code. And it would be inherently faster, inherently more efficient, because it would be constrained. It wouldn't let you do slow things or to um, put pop-ups in the face of the user, et cetera. But it was super module. You want a module even. You want an image carousel, there's a module. A form, there's a module, et cetera. And it grows and evolves um, over time. And increasingly, why is this relevant? because increasingly these modules are available as Gutenberg blocks and as WordPress plugins. So now you can build and maintain a website that's perfectly performant and fast, that hits all of the core web vitals metrics, that is inherently structured and understandable by Google without having an army of developers. It's all just plug and play. And what's more is with AMP, your website gets better over time. It automatically adopts new features, which bypasses challenges of adoption and standards. If Google wants to roll out a new standard for, say, image markup, they can just implement that into AMP, and it trickles out to everybody's sites running AMP. Hint, this happens almost all the time. These AMP websites that your competitors are on are evolving faster than yours are. Scary stuff, right? Because now you have a radically reduced future dev cost. Your website's made from plug-and-play components, and so on and so on. But of course, getting ahead, there are other parts of your digital ecosystem, CRMs, ESPs, apps. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just kind of systemize all of that and join it all up? Well, let's evolve the scope of what we're looking at because we can't really talk about just AMP without also talking about progressive web apps. 
PWAs are a term coined by Google, which allow your website to act as if it were an app, uh, an app to install itself on your phone and gain access to desktop space, to permissions, to APIs, and so on and so forth. And of course, coincidentally, Google also develops the leading WordPress PWA plugin that ties directly into the AMP plugin that makes all of this happen seamlessly and automatically in the background. Interestingly, I rebuilt my website recently using the AMP plugin and the PWA plugin over the course of a week. And I tell you what, it is fast and sleek. So now your website is also an app and has a suite of APIs and a gateway to all your users' context. It integrates into and out of all your other systems. The only thing we're really missing is a suite to understand what's going on with all of this. Well, it turns out that all of your Search Console, Google Analytics, PageSpeed Insights, Tag Manager, and Google Ads information is available in the Google Site Kit plugin for WordPress, which is the only thing Google have ever launched that brings all of those together in one place. This solves for monitoring, decision-making, making business cases, and radically lowers the barrier to identifying insight and opportunity. Ha! Huh. All these systems build on top of each other and they deliver exponentially expanding capabilities. Now, to be clear, you can do all of this without WordPress, without Google, without AMP, but it will be a thousand times harder and slower and more riddled with bugs. And there's more to come. This isn't just about a few shiny endorsed Google tools. It's about the complete standardization of the platform of the web. Interesting, right? Because if you're building your own sites and maintaining them, maybe that's a bad investment. If you think WordPress is a toy for amateurs or not suitable for B2B lead gen or whatever industry you're in, maybe you should reconsider. Because if your competitors are adopting this stack, maybe you should think about how much of an insurmountable unfair advantage they have on multiple fronts. Of course, you can just say maybe we should spend more on paid ads, except again, some of your competitors will and your audience will see their content. And there'll be fewer people searching for the kinds of terms you want to compete for because those people will already have had their problems solved and met in the search results. And many of the businesses who fail to adopt these new platforms will look for alternatives. So this is gonna get harder and harder. Hi, Anne, you're right. Just sat in the background where this is nice. We can go through this together. Um, I'm gonna skip some of this because I'm almost out of time. So I'm gonna zoom out very, very quickly and summarize where we're at and what we do. Um, incidentally, um, so you need to be a good fit for your audience, essentially. You need to have a perfect platform. You need to expose all your solutions in the format Google can understand. You need to do that in a way that loads instantaneously and does so everywhere and in every format. And you need to understand all of that in order to be able to act on it. And conveniently, um, there is a piece of software that sits neatly at the top of that triangle that joins all of this up. A big part of my day job is coordinating with people in various different parts of these teams and bits of Google, and WordPress and app, and making sure that it all ties up and talks to each other, which is pretty awesome. And when you've done that, you can focus more on trust and on fit, because all that time you spent fixing 404s and speeding up your awful, slow legacy tech stack is now free to not tell more compelling um, stories in your marketing, but to improve your product marketing, improve your quality of customer service, to do all the things that actually should change and improve your proposition. Very quickly then, one last thought. Because um, if you've heard people like Rand Fishkin talk about his perspective of this paradigm, he rightly points out that this is riddled with challenges. There are questions around motivations and strategies for publishers and whether Google stealing people's content is inherently evil and how do we um, solve for business models that um, allow publishers to create content. These are all good questions. We don't have an answer for what next looks like because this is new. This is the first time we have ever done this on the web and there is no rule book, no handbook, no reference. People, people, SEOs in particular, demand answers to how all this uh, aspects of this new ecosystem will work and how attribution will work and how much. We don't know because this is unfolding iteratively. And if I skip forward very quickly, there is one thing I would like you to do, <coughs> which is perhaps to blame ourselves for this. If you're, if you're concerned, that having lots of visitors suddenly not turn up at your website because they've got their problem solved in Google will impact your business model and your revenue and your salary. It's kind of our fault. We built and enabled this new world. We provided bad experiences. We continue to build it. As users, we could use DuckDuckGo. As marketers, we could invest in better strategies. As business owners, we could think about platform diversification. But now it is too late, too late for regrets. This isn't the future. This is now. So I think... <laughs> The answer is to bet on Google. Your strategy might not manifest as a conventional website. It might output as an app or pipe straight into the search results, but you will need a platform where that content and marketing content lives. And surprise, surprise, soon enough, you'll be able to manage all of these different properties in the pyramid from your WordPress website. We need to be thinking about our websites as platforms for managing our content and integrations. Lastly then, um, WordPress is open source. AMP is open source, Gutenberg, the plugins that Google are working on are all open source, Yoast is open source. 
All of those people are imploring you for your input and your expertise. If this concerns you or worries you or scares you or makes you angry, the answer is to get involved. I know that's contentious and I burn people struggle with time, but I implore you to join the conversations. Um, this is remarkably easy. This is an example of a ticket that I opened in WordPress core relating to some niche performance bug I spot. I only spotted it because I'm the only SEO in the space. Now every WordPress site is 5% faster. I did the same thing in the app repository. I spotted a bug that would have flooded all our server logs with um, an SEO uh, oddity. It took me five minutes to write up a summary and the guys fixed that. These people are imploring you for help. Almost all of your analytics all broke overnight for your AMP pages. And I only spotted it by chance because I'm the only SEO and analytics nerd in that channel. Please come and get involved in these conversations. Google are, for better or worse, accidentally or deliberately, fundamentally changing the shape of the internet. And we are not there. You have to come and get involved in those conversations or commit to spending a lot more on your paid apps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jono. The comments have been amazing. Um, I, I, I quite like you to sort of carry on contributing to that chat. Um, there's some really, I mean, I've seen this present, a similar presentation and it inspires me whenever I hear it. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I guess if you could possibly put in the chat some links of where people can go for additional yeah, information, definitely. that would be really, really helpful. Uh, and then um, thank you so much. And um, hopefully next time I get you to present, it'll be on a live stage and you can have a full hour. <laughs> oh, that'd be nice. Awesome. I look forward to it. It's been so lovely to see you and everyone again. Um, and I will hang around and answer some questions.